In the shadowy depths of society's darkest corners, the tragic tale of Daisy Coleman unfolds, a haunting narrative that unveils a harrowing reality, one that forces us to confront the profound injustices that persist within our world. This is the chilling story of Daisy Coleman, a name that should be etched in our collective memory. Melinda Coleman, a small-town veterinarian, was startled out of sleep on January 8, 2012, shortly before 5 in the morning, by something happening in her front yard. She was shocked to discover her 14-year-old daughter Daisy, who was shoeless and just dressed in a t-shirt and yoga pants, comatose in the snow when she opened the door and looked outside. Melinda brought her icy cold daughter inside the home with the assistance of her boys. Daisy had been out in the bitter cold for an indeterminate amount of time, but long enough for her hair to stick to the ground. Daisy's mother had put her in a warm water tub after covering her with blankets was ineffective in raising her body temperature. She then saw that the teenager's inner thighs had bruises. She hurried her to the hospital because she thought there had been a sexual assault. They also phoned the local sheriff's department. Unbeknownst to the Coleman family at the time, they were set to engage in a court struggle whereby Daisy would be depicted as a juvenile vixen who had her just desserts, while the accused attacker would be presented as the victim. Later that morning, a rape kit was used, along with a number of laboratory tests, one of which would reveal Daisy's blood alcohol content to be 134.9, over twice the legal limit. She had clearly not had anything to drink for many hours at that time, and the fact that she was still legally intoxicated suggested that she was probably close to unconscious when she ended up on her family's front yard. With her head still hazy from drinking, Daisy was not in a position to comment on what had happened the night before. In light of this, it fell to Paige, her closest friend, who had spent the night at the Coleman home, to provide the missing details. 13-year-old Paige told police that she and Daisy had been escorted to a small gathering at the house of the town's top football player, despite the fact that she seemed to be in a bit of a haze. They had arrived to find that they were the only females there, even if there were a few other guys around. Paige was able to provide a thorough description of what had happened that particular night as her consciousness improved. She remembered that the two of them had started the stay at Daisy's home by smuggling a few sips from the family's liquor cupboard. Their goal was to see what all the excitement was about, not necessarily to get wasted. As the evening carried on, Daisy started texting her close buddy, Charlie's elder brother, Matt Barnett, who is 17 years old. The high school freshman had been delighted to be offered the opportunity to hang out with juniors and seniors when he asked them to his parents' home for a couple drinks. They had leaped at the opportunity, believing they had struck the social jackpot. After sneaking out the bedroom window, they met Matt and his friends who were waiting for them around the corner a short time later. They were led down the basement upon reaching their location and instructed to be quiet to avoid waking his parents. Paige said that as soon as the door closed behind them, their host began supplying Daisy with drinks. A lad of 15 had grabbed her by the hand and led her into an adjacent room as she sat there watching her companion drink glass after glass of alcohol. Once he got her all to himself, the kid started pushing himself on Paige, even though she had warned him over and over to stop. She had begged him to let her go, but he had ignored her protests, pinning her down and raping her. After it was over, Paige had quickly returned to the other room. There were still several of the lads she'd seen earlier, but Matt and Daisy were noticeably missing. She had peeked through the slightly ajar door after hearing some odd sounds coming from the next room and saw her buddy half off, half on the bed. She was limp, teetering on the brink of awareness, and her body was murmuring gibberish. Remarkably, both she and Matt were nude below the waist. Just a few minutes later, Matt and Daisy came out of the room completely clothed. She was so drunk that she was unable to stand on her own, even though he seemed level-headed and stable. The girls were brought to the vehicle and driven home, as if the night's events had come to an end. Paige was instructed to go to sleep by one of the lads as they drew up in front of Coleman's home. They told her that until Daisy woke up, they would remain with her since she was still too sleepy to walk. 
Taking their word for it, she had gone inside and tucked herself into bed. As soon as Paige was no longer in the picture, the boys removed Daisy from the car and set her down on the grass. They had decided against spending any more time with the visibly handicapped child since the sun was about to rise and they did not want to risk being noticed with him. After that, they got in their vehicle and drove off carefree. Charlie, Daisy's brother, went outside later that morning and dug around in the snow until he located her cell phone. After going back and listening to the recordings, he was surprised to hear that his sister had been talking to the other jock he had previously considered to be a friend. Because he knew Matt in such depth, he was positive that Paige was telling the truth when she said that. All of the suspects were rounded up and brought to the sheriff's office to face questioning together. After his arrest, Matty B was charged with the felony of sexual assault, as well as the misdemeanor of endangering the welfare of a child. Both of these offenses are considered criminal acts. According to the confessions made by the boys, the investigators found out that the exchanges had been filmed on camera. As a direct consequence of this, Zek, now 17, has been charged with the offense of sexually exploiting a child. After first declining to respond, Zek later revealed that he had videotaped portions of the discussion using the phone of a buddy. This is reflected in the recordings. Following that, a search warrant was acquired in order to access the basement of the Burnett family home. Inside, they found a bottle of Bacardi Big Apple, three phones, one of which was Zek's phone that he used to record the video, a blanket, bed sheets, and a pair of underwear that had been found on the bedroom floor. The alleged threats made by the boys generated conversations, and one of them tweeted, I hope she gets what's coming. White remembers that in the days following the arrests, she would come to the sheriff's office on an almost daily basis. When we sat down together, I would endeavor to explain everything to her and do my best to answer any questions that she had. According to Sheriff White, and the following day she would show up, and we would go through the whole thing again. Daisy was hit with an onslaught of hate mail and threats, the most of which were sent over social media, when members of the community betrayed her family. Daisy's harassment took place primarily online. She put in three separate bids for her own life. After the family had moved out of town, the house was put up for sale, and at that time it caught fire. In 2014, the person who attacked Daisy filed a guilty plea to a charge of endangering the welfare of a child, which is a class A misdemeanor. Despite this, Daisy was still left feeling emotionally and mentally drained as a result of the ordeal. Permit that her narrative serves as both a demonstration of the resiliency of the human spirit and a rallying cry for the creation of a society that is more equitable and caring. Together, we have the power to fight toward a culture in which accounts such as Daisy's are less common and in which survivors are provided with the courage and support they need to recover and flourish. Thank you for joining us on this journey, and may Daisy's memory continue to inspire us to strive for a more compassionate and equitable world.